Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, we uh, think uh, today of uh, how it is that um, you are a magnificent God, and yet not always do we see you in all of your glory. And sometimes in life there are things which confuse and distract. And so we pray that today you'll help us to see you with clearer vision and help us, Lord, to by your Holy Spirit, be led into truth that is eternal. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're talking about seeing through other eyes. If you've been following along with our Avondale reading calendar, then you've read uh, Psalm 73. And that's where we are today, and, and uh, we've referred to that already in the service. Um, <clears throat> Psalm 119, verse 18, talks about our spiritual eyesight, and it's a prayer. The psalmist says, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things from your law. The psalmist understood that unless God opened his eyes, he would not see and he would not understand spiritual truth and be able to appreciate it. Psalm 19, verse 8, The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. And the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Psalm 36, 9, For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Again, just emphasizing that only when God shines light on things do we see true light. Psalm 63, verse 2, Yes, in the sanctuary I have seen you and witnessed your power and your splendor. Proverbs 3, 7. Do not be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Proverbs 26, verse 12. Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for him. And when we come to the New Testament, we read uh, uh, in one of the sermons that Paul was preaching that the Lord Jesus came to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, and they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 is part of a three-point prayer that Paul prays for the Christians that were in Ephesus, and part of that is, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And without God opening our eyes, we are blind to that truth. First John 2.11 says, But the one who hates his brother is in darkness, and he walks in darkness. And he does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. In Revelation 3, verse 18, speaking to the church at Laodicea, the church of unsaved people, Jesus said this, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and eye salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see, because in their present state they were spiritually blind. I think of in Paul's words to the church at Corinth, a natural man that is a man who is unsaved does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and neither can he understand them because they are discerned by the Holy Spirit that is within him. Only God can open the eyes of the blind. And when he does, we see things that bring us joy and peace and cause things to suddenly make sense. We need those other eyes and God opens them so that we can behold wondrous things about him. Our prayer ought to be, open my spiritual eyes, Lord. 
that I may delight in knowing you and your truth. But there is a warning. All through the, the Bible, there is a warning that if we do not see correctly, there is a danger. It's the danger of defection. Sadly, from time to time, I meet people who have defected from the faith, who have stopped believing what they once were so sure of, have stopped reading their Bible and stopped going to church. Some of them were once vibrant in the faith and zealous in their service to the Lord and committed to sharing their faith and eager to study the Bible. And, but something, or usually some things, happened that caused them to become disillusioned and discouraged and disappointed or even to think that they've been deceived. Sometimes it was a bad experience which God did not prevent in their lives. But whatever it is, it put them out, it put out the Spirit's fire in their lives, made them take a step back and away and even question the truth they were once so committed to. In a word, they have defected from the faith. The danger of defection has faced every generation of God's people. It's a subject that God addresses in the Bible over and over again. In fact, the history of Israel is replete with stories and with the consequences of Israel def defecting from the faith. I can almost see the headlines of the newspaper in Israel. Israel turns from God to serve idols. Choose your God today, warns Joshua. God warns Israel of exile for defecting from the faith. Judah defects from faith, goes into captivity. Hymenius and Alexander's shipwrecked faith. You know, there were uh, many of, of Jesus' disciples that were alarmed by his teaching in the sixth chapter of John. And it says, from that time on, many of his disciples walked no more with him. We're not talking about the twelve, but other followers of Jesus. From that time on, they turned and walked away from Jesus, and that was the end. Paul warned Timothy to be careful to guard the faith that was once delivered to him. In fact, guarding, our spiritual, uh, guarding against spiritual defection is part of our spiritual warfare. In Ephesians chapter 6, we are instructed to use that shield of faith in our daily walk to prevent Satan's fiery darts from doing their damage. And I'm afraid that many Christians who have not used that shield are greatly damaged, and it shows. We should never doubt in the darkness what God has shown us in the light, but it will be tested. One of the major reasons for writing the book of Hebrews was to warn the Jewish believers against defecting from the faith. So that, that, that is a major topic throughout the book of Hebrews. The danger was not losing salvation, but losing inheritance. It's serious business with God and ought to be with us. And the warning was watch out, for many will fall prey to a wrong perspective and you could too, and defect. How do we prevent that? Listen to the words of Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance that race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you 
will not grow weary and lose heart. So that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So that you do not become weary and tired and worn out or burned out and lose heart and become discouraged or disillusioned and even defect from the faith. Those who take their eyes off the Lord in his example to us of what it means, of what it means to go through life with, unan- with uh, hardship and difficulty. Those who take their eyes off the Lord are in danger of being confused and defecting. I think that's especially true when we think about the successes and the easy life of the ungodly, the unchurched, the unbelievers who do not have God in their lives, and yet they have nice personalities and are thoughtful and have life so easy and fun and seem to have the good life without even a nod toward God. And when we see wicked people, obviously immoral and bad people, whom we can only define as wicked, prosper and and seem to have no worries through life, if you're not careful, it can get under your skin and really irritate. Why do they have it so good? And I struggle through life. And we can come to the point where we say this. It's just not fair. God, it's just not fair. Why should the wicked people who oppose God be better off than those who trust him? It's not fair. The unhindered and unpunished crimes of the wicked are inexplicable and troubling to us. Why does God let them get away with it? Why does God allow the wicked to have health and prosperity? Why does he allow them to get away with murder and rape and theft and get away with aggression and oppression of the righteous? Where is God when the wicked prosper and the gunman shoots up a church? Why do I have to struggle with pain and problems and debt and deprivation when the wicked are in good health and can afford the luxurious life? Why do I not experience the material and health blessings, at least as well as the unrighteous do. I live a godly life. I live in service to others. I've led people to the Lord and kept them from going to eternal hell. I've tried hard to avoid sin and shameful practices. Why do I have health problems when some high-profile people from Hollywood live their lives in debauchery to 100 years old? It's not fair. Why am I not rewarded financially when I've made an eternal difference in the lives of people? It's just not fair. That is the thinking of a person who has become spiritually blind. Read it out loud with me from the screen. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Consider him. Jesus said, the birds of the air have nests and the fox has its den, but the Son of Man is nowhere to lay his head. In fact, Jesus never owned any property or built a, a, a magnificent cathedral. And although Jesus miraculously provided fish and bread to the thousands, there was no record of him ever taking up an offering at the many public Meetings that he held. If our eyes are not fixed on Jesus and his example of going through life, sometimes suffering need, then we are also in danger of confusion and even defection. The psalmist Asaph had a personal struggle with defection from the faith when he thought about these issues. Almost 
threw in the towel. He almost quit. He almost defected. And he wrote about that struggle in Psalm 73, which I'd like you to look at with me. He begins it with a wonderful truth. God is good to his people. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. As he writes this, it is both a truth that he has always held, but it's also a conclusion that he firmly holds to at the, as a result of going through a personal crisis in his faith. He always knew it was true. There are a lot of truths, of spiritual truths, that we kind of know and give assent to, but only when we've come through some kind of a crisis does that truth really stand out as true truth to me. Here's a a kind of a paraphrase of the way that um, Asaph, of what Asaph believed. If you are God's chosen, that is Israel, and if you are good, he says, pure in heart, you will see God's blessings on you. That's what was bothering Asaph. See, he was limiting those blessings to the here and now and to health and wealth. And that kind of thinking is erroneous, and it was first found in the book of Job. Job and his friends believe that God punishes the wicked with the kind of suffering that Job was going through. He'd lost his health, and he'd lost his wealth. And that he blesses the righteous person with the kind of blessings that Job used to have, health and wealth. And that was the argument of Job's friends all the way through their prolonged speeches. Fess up, Job. What did you do to deserve the hand of God's judgment on you? We know you're hiding something. Stop talking so pious that you're innocent. That kind of thinking resurfaces itself here again in Psalm 73 during the kingdom era, about a thousand years after Job. And if you fast forward about another thousand years after David, it was the thinking of the Pharisees of Jesus' day. They thought that being rich was a sign that God approves of you. And the disciples, even on one occasion, in the ninth chapter of John, said, Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? I've always wondered why they thought that he maybe sinned before he was born, and that's why that never made a lot of sense to me. But that was their question. I, again, the idea was that if God is pleased with you, you will receive blessings in the here and now of wealth and health. Fast forward another 2,000 years to our time. It's somewhat the thinking of today's prosperity gospel preachers. Only in today's message by prosperity, in the prosperity gospel, there's a lot less emphasis on being good. The problem with thinking that God blesses right here and right now in tangible ways has too many hidden expectations and not enough eternal perspective. And that is why Asaph, the author of Psalm 73, had a crisis in his faith. He says in verse 2, As for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. Asaph was an Israelite, therefore one of God's chosen people. He was pure in heart, and yet he was not experiencing near the level of the good life that others less godly were experiencing, and it left Asaph bitter. He says, I nearly defected. 
I nearly walked away from it all. I thought I was firmly planted on the truth of the Word of God, but then I almost slipped off, slipped off. I nearly lost my footing on the truth. I had a crisis of faith. What happened to you? We would ask. Well, I became envious of the prosperous wicked. I started looking at the world, the unbelievers, those who do not even believe in God, and in fact, those who are arrogant and even shake their fist at God. They live wicked lives, indulging in sins I would never think of. But what I saw bothered me. It bothered me a lot. I saw they were wicked and oppressive, but also prosperous and trouble-free. I saw they do not struggle with the struggles I have. They have strong, healthy bodies, whereas I struggle with pain and disease and aches and pains and other health concerns. They seem to be free from the burdens that are common to the human experience of financial troubles and problems at home. And but verse 4, but they have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens, and they're not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence from their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. They kill and have no pity. They steal and have no remorse. From their callous hearts comes iniquity, and their evil imaginations have no limit. They're always plotting their next victim, their next sin. And they scoff at us who are righteous and trying to live according to the will of God. And they threaten and scare people into cowering. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? The crowds love and respect them because of their power, their strength, and they hold them in high regard. How would your God know what we do? In fact, we don't think your God knows anything that we do. Otherwise, he would stop us, wouldn't he? And he can't. Admit it. Your God is unable to do anything about us. He can't protect you from us. So pay up. Here is what you owe us to keep us from destroying you. This is what the wicked are like. They're always free of care. They go on amassing wealth. The problem is, if we're not careful, we'll begin to question what we've always believed about God. You may wonder why God did not stop arrogant men like Hitler and Stalin and Mussolini from their crimes against humanity. Why did God allow that evil man to rape my friend? How could God allow child abuse and human trafficking? Asaph said, my feet almost slipped. I nearly lost my faith when I saw the arrogant and prosperity of the wicked. I envied them. I envied their wealth. I envied their health and their luxurious living. I envied their carefree life. And at the time, Asaph was spiritually blind. He had bitterness at the suffering righteous. Surely in vain. I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I've been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments. And what did it get me for living with a pure heart and innocent in my actions? What did it get me? 
The wicked are better off than I am. God has not rewarded my purity. He has not rewarded my innocence. All day long I have been afflicted. I've got arthritis and rheumatism and muscle pain and swelling of the joints. I deal with insufficient funds and people who oppose me just because I'm a believer. Every morning I wake up to new troubles and discouraging problems. I feel punished just for trying to do the right thing and be a decent person. I'd be better off following the ways of the wicked. Look at them. They get away with any and everything. Asaph is actually questioning the very core of his character. Everything that's important, he is questioning. He's contemplating walking away, walking away from godliness and embracing the ways of the world. He is thinking about defecting from the faith. His blindness to spiritual truth. He is torn on the inside. He would like to come out and say what he is struggling with, but he is reserved. He doesn't want to do that. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it deeply troubled me. He couldn't talk about his frustrations. But he was not willing to negative, negatively affect the faith of the next generation. So he kept his mouth shut about the matter and just had the private inner pain and struggle of unanswered questions. Now, when I was in college, I took a course in logic. And I'm kind of curious, has anybody here ever taken a course in logic? Oh, I'm in trouble. Most of you have, so see, you know. All right. Well, we studied deductive reasoning, and we learned about uh, a logical syllogism. And a logical syllogism has three parts. You've got a main premise, and a minor premise, and a conclusion. So a logical uh, deductive argument draws a conclusion that's based on two premises. And an example would be, all men are mortals. I am a man, therefore I am a mortal. And, and it, it works here. It's both valid reasoning and it's also true because the premises are true. Uh, they're based on actual facts. Thus, of necessity, the conclusion is also true. But what happens if the main premise or the minor premise is not true? For example, all dogs have fleas. That animal does not have fleas, therefore it is not a dog. Now, there's something wrong with that argument because the original premise is not true. Thus, you cannot determine a dog by its fleas. Or how about this one? In March Madness, the number one overall seed team will always beat number 16. Minor premise, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County is number 16 seed, and the University of Virginia is number one overall seed. Conclusion, therefore, UV will beat UMBC, right? Wrong. They didn't. In fact, the final score was University of Maryland, Baltimore County, 74, University of Virginia, 54. This was the 136th time that a number 16 played a number one. For the first time ever, a number 16 beat a number one. And what makes matters worse or better, depending on your perspective, is that UMBC had never before in history of the school won a game in an NCAA tournament. Never. And so if the premise is not based on absolute truth, you best not pronounce a conclusion. Asaph's logical problem was far more important than a basketball tournament. At stake for him was the core of who he was. What he had been taught, his character, even his social behavior. Asaph drew a wrong conclusion from a wrong premise that was based on a wrong perspective. 
His premise did not take into account different kinds of blessings or an eternal perspective. His argument was something like this. His main premise, God blesses the Israelites who are pure in heart in their eternal lifetime with wealth and health. His minor premise, I am an Israelite who is pure in heart, living my earthly life. Conclusion, therefore, God should bless me with wealth and health. Or the reverse of that would be, God opposes the wicked and judges them in their earthly lifetime, withholding health and wealth. Job's friends would agree with that, and the Pharisees, Jesus' day, etc. Minor premise, Ahab was clearly a wicked man. Conclusion, therefore, God opposed Ahab, making him sick and poor. Only the record doesn't show that. Ahab still got away with murder, at least for a while, and he still reigned 22 years, which was fairly long for kings of that day. But we have no record of Ahab being sickly from his sins, and he certainly was not poor. Now, true, he did die from a well-placed arrow, but other uh, Israelites died that same day as well. And we know from the record that after Ahab's death, uh, his sons were all killed uh, as part of God's judgment on him, disgracing his name, preventing any of his descendants from sitting on the throne. Of course, the worst thing for him would be that Ahab was likely not saved and went to hell where he still is to this day. Gracefully, Asaph's faith was restored. Asaph said, I was very upset until one day One day, I entered the sanctuary of God, and then I understood. I understood their final destiny, that is, the wicked's future. Suddenly, it became clear to me. What did Asaph see when he walked into the temple? God opened Asaph's eyes to spiritual truth. He opened his eyes to compare the here and now with eternity to the fate of the wicked. And he also opened Asaph's eyes to the real and wonderful blessings of Asaph's relationship with God. But first God showed him the final destiny of the wicked. He got his eyes off of the right here and now wealth and health, onto an eternal destiny of the wicked. These matters were only perceived when God opened his spiritual eyes. So the real story of the wicked was this. First of all, they were insecure. They were insecure. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. Their position looked secure, but it was not. And their destiny, destruction and terror. They are headed for ruin. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. Their destiny is hell. And their time is short. Verse 20 says, they are like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. Their prosperity will only last a short time, and and then it's like you wake up, and they're gone like a bad dream. Their brief existence and their time in the sun is limited. Their oppression about to end. Their popularity and prosperity about to go south. Like a bad dream that you despise. It's very short. And suddenly, as he's in that temple, he begins to think and to say to himself, what in the world 
was I thinking? With opened eyes, he now says, man, I came so close. I came so close to throwing it away. Verse 21, when my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and I was ignorant and I was a brute beast before you. Look at the words there, what they say. My heart was grieved, my spirit embittered, I was senseless, I was ignorant, I was like a brute beast that can't think very deeply. There may be, even be some cause and effect here. His heart was grieved because of the problems that he faced. His spirit was embittered because the wicked seemed to have so few problems. He was embittered and saying, God, you're not being fair to me. It seems to have caused him to be senseless and stupid. Mentality of an ignorant, stupid beast. I wasn't thinking any deeper than a common bull can think. I believe that blindness, or rather that bitterness, blinds us to a proper perspective on ourselves and others. If you harbor bitterness in your heart, your heart cannot see yourself or other people as God sees them. See Asaph's present blessings. God opened him up, his mind, his spiritual understanding, to see the blessings in the here and now that Asaph did have. I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And then afterward, you will take me into glory in the future. He had God's presence. It was like God was there with him all the time. He was never without God's presence. And he had God's guidance. God was taking him by the hand and leading him. And he was headed for eternal glory with God. With open eyes, his heart filled with praise. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. You are my all in all. You're the most important thing in my life. There's no one I want a relationship with more than you. It means so much to me, God, to be close to you. I'm fulfilling the very purpose for which I was made, to live in fellowship and praise of you, and I'm enjoying it because you opened my eyes. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God, you are the strength of my heart, and you are my portion forever. You're going to usher me into glory someday when I die. You are the sole object of my desire, my worship. I may not have the trappings of wealth today, but I'm headed for king territory. I don't have a perfect body now. But I'm headed for a glorious body that will be fashioned like the Lord Jesus. And in the meantime, you've allowed me to enjoy the wonderful, priceless fellowship with you, the God of the universe, the lover of my soul. Only people who have their spiritual eyes open can really enjoy life. The psalmist would say, I have it all. Those who are far from you will perish. You will destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, 
It is so good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. And I'm going to tell the whole world about all your deeds. No matter what happens, the daily pain, the daily struggles, it is so good to be near you. It's so good to be in fellowship. Others wrote of the same thing. Psalm 34, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in in you in the sight of the children of mankind. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. I am so very blessed. God's mercies are new every morning. So when the adversities of life come our way and things happen we cannot understand, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author of faith. Sometimes we just need to just stand and be faithful to the Lord no matter what comes our way. In this life, the Lord Jesus needs to be our focus. Our prayer should be, O God, give me one pure and holy passion. Give me one magnificent obsession. Jesus, give me one glorious ambition for my life to know and follow hard after you to know and follow hard after you, to grow as your disciple in the truth. This world is empty. It's pale and poor compared to knowing you, my Lord. Lead me on. I will run after you. Bow your heads with me, would you? I want to know... How is your spiritual vision? Has it been clouded by the cares of this world? Do you see that God really loves you? That he cares? Have you entered that one magnificent obsession to know and follow hard after Jesus Christ? Is that what matters most to you? And today, God would love for you to turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face so the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. He wants you to enjoy him today. Are you? Father, we ask you to put within the heart of each one of us a vision for Jesus only, a magnificent obsession to follow hard in our fellowship and our enjoyment of the one who loves us infinitely. May we love you back. And we pray in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen. Go into the world in peace and have courage and hold on 
to the things that are good. Honor and serve the Lord in the power of his Holy Spirit. And may God's grace be with us. In Jesus' name, amen.